Okay. Hello, this is Conversations with Marsha. I'm Marsha Familero Enright. And today we're going to talk to David Potts, who's a longtime philosophy professor, most recently at a city college. And we're going to need to talk to him about teaching philosophy, why it's important, and his experience with the students at the college. I want to remind listeners that this uh, conversation is sponsored by the Great Connections Seminar. We do weekend and week-long programs for young people uh, to help them build a life of adventure and creative achievement. Uh, they find it innovative and transformative as a program. Um, I'm the director of the Great Connections and uh, please subscribe to us. If you'd like to know more about the, the programs for young people, go to thegreatconnections.org. So today I'd like to talk to um, David, who is a longtime friend of mine. David, I was trying to remember when we first met or how, or any, I can't even think about it. I know David was, I have a philosophy discussion club here in Chicago and uh, he belonged to it for many years, but I don't remember how we even got to know each other. Do you? I, uh, I, I don't really uh, either. I, uh, I met uh, first your husband, John, I'm pretty sure, <laughs> at, a, at a meeting that was, you know, kind of a, sh a Chicago local uh, oh, meeting okay. sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, hosted by a guy in the presidential towers uh, uh, when it um, uh, for a while for a while this guy decided he wanted to host these uh, these meetings and I, I'm pretty sure that I encountered John there for the first time okay. and uh, he actually he drove me home from that meeting because uh, I was living in Hyde Park and uh, you guys uh, mm -hmm. you guys live on the south side gotcha. I, I, wasn't there a um they, they they used to have these summer seminars also and didn't I did, that might be the first, my, 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 my first memory of you was that uh, as well. Anyway, it's been a long time. Okay, it's been a long time, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Anyway, so tell us a little bit about your background. How did you get into philosophy? I know at first you were in psychology, right? Well, no, I, I actually uh, decided uh, when I was, you know, 20 and 19 years old or something like that to become a philosopher. And uh, <clears throat> at that time I was going to college uh, at uh, uh, a little engineering school, uh, thinking that uh, physics and engineering, actually it was called engineering physics. It was a, a, this a school was a very small engineering only, it's a mineral engineering college. Uh, every what college is it? The Colorado School of Mines. Oh, sure. It's actually not, you know, it's a reasonably well-known place. So, yes. Uh, actually, anyway, anyway, this is so engineering oriented. Even their math degree is called engineering mathematics. I see. <laughs> and so, so, uh, so when I decided I was going to do philosophy, there was no staying there. Um, so I, uh, so I transferred to a big state school, the University of Texas, and uh, <clears throat> with the with the deliberate intention. You know, to become to become a I philosopher. See. So I didn't even actually major in philosophy. I figured I would just pick that up at graduate school, and then I moved to Chicago for uh, graduate school in philosophy. <clears throat> and mm -hmm. uh, uh, so, but 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 I got I got sidetracked. I um uh, I encountered a I I was interested in in the, in the theory of knowledge uh, specifically, but I, I wanted it to be empirically based. I wanted to know about the psychology of knowledge as well as uh, the philosophy, and so. Um, so I started uh, looking around, and and this was, the, this was like the, I guess it's kind of a long time, but this is like the cognitivist revolution in um, um, in can psychology. You, can you explain to to viewers what what that was? Yeah, what that was is uh, basically to 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 make a to make a long story short, computers got invented in the 1940s, and pretty soon people started thinking that you know maybe the the, the human mind. You know, is kind of is like a computer. It's sort of a me metaphors in action. I think metaphors actually drive an awful lot of uh, innovation in scientific thinking. And um, anyway, so so the idea, you know, the little light bulb went off over the heads of uh, people like Herbert A. Simon, uh, who was a, a famous cognitive psychologist and Nobel Prize winner, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, um, <clears throat> you know, to, saying maybe the mind, maybe the human mind, looks like like a CPU, like a like a computer. Mm -hmm. And um, so that was kind of the death knell of behaviorism, which had been the uh, the, the the leading psychological paradigm, if you uh, if you like, uh, up to then. And so this led to uh, the death of behaviorism and the coalescence of uh, trends in psychology and philosophy and linguistics and artificial intelligence, uh, all converging, you know, on uh, on what came to be called very soon uh, cognitive science, 
mm-hmm. like in the 1960s and 70s. And uh, so, so which, which, which really led to a, a great deal of innovation and exciting developments in, uh, in later 20th century philosophy, actually around the, uh, around the theory of knowledge and philosophy of psychology. So the, and, the hmm? experiments that they did in psychology revealed a lot of things about how the human mind works and that influenced what people were thinking in philosophy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, um, uh, they 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 started they started taking seriously the idea of uh, internal processes of the cognitive processes of uh, a various kind, and it led to led to a series of new uh, new new ideas, new developments in um, uh, in psychology. Psy- psychologists started you know thinking that it's not just uh, behavioral reinforcement that uh, that leads to learning, but actually um, um, cognitive processes. And uh, philosophers, philosophers were a part of this uh, part of this development. It's um, probably hard for people today who, who just through the regular press learn have learned a lot about the uh, some of the ideas that came out of the cognitive revolution to realize what psychology was before that, where yeah. they were basically denying that there was anything going on internally, and that all you had to look at was it was a black box, and yeah. all you could look at was the the yeah animal or the human's behavior right and the and the leading you know philosophers of the time they all bought into this also they were all mm-hmm. you know more or less that was you know the, 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 this was what the responsible you know the scientific community was saying and the philosophers weren't going to uh were going to oppose it mm-hmm. and um so you know a lot of well-known philosophers that you will, will have heard of are uh, made their names advocating uh 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 Behaviorism, uh, su- such as Gilbert Ryle, you know, would, would, mm-hmm. would be an obvious name there, and uh, and others like uh, Willard Van Orman Quine, uh, the perhaps the the most prestigious leading American philosopher of the mid twentieth century. Mm-hmm. This whole philosophy is wrapped around behaviorism. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I just wanted to mention that Gilbert Ryle is fav- famous for saying that the mind is the ghost in the machine. Mm-hmm. That's where that idea came from. Uh, so you so you decided to get. You got sidetracked into cognitive psychology. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so a, a, a professor at the this is a remarkable, you know, thing actually. A, a professor at the university in Chicago where I was, uh, who was in he was a he was a vision scientist. So, uh, psychology of sense perception. And vision. Where, where were you? This was the University of Illinois at Chicago. And and who was the professor? Um. Oh, uh, Haber. Ralph Haber, and it took took me a minute. Ralph Haber, okay. uh, who was you know a, a prominent, um, he was actually one of the one of the sort of one, one of the stars of the psychology department at mm-hmm. uh, at the time. Anyway, uh, he said, you know what you should do, you should get two PhDs. Right? You should get one in philosophy and in psychology. You'd be unstoppable. You'd be a monster. You should really do this. It would be great. You know, this is this is the cognitive science revolution. You should, uh, you should do this. And so. So I did, you know. So, so I, so I entered, I entered the psych program in parallel with the with the philosophy. I didn't leave philosophy, but I had finished all my my qualif- my my qualifying exams and stuff like that in uh, in philosophy. I was ready to do my dissertation in philosophy, in other words. And um, uh, so I entered the I entered the psychology program. I had never taken a psychology class in my life, and um, so I just started in graduate school learning learning psychology, and uh, that. That took a few years, and um, so I, I finally finished in psychology and did a postdoc and stuff like that. But by that time, I was pretty burnt out, and um, you know the the the, the thought of, of turning around and going back and spending a few more years writing a dissertation in philosophy was not appealing. And um, so, so I was offered a computer job oh. um, <laughs> uh, in the, in the, in Chicago. Um, Actually, actually, by the, the the research that I did for my dissertation in uh, in psychology, the most interesting uh, part of that uh, was the computer programming that I had to do uh, to control uh, the experiment. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was, in a way, that was sort of that seduced me away, you know, from my calling. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, although, I mean, it was fun. I mean, at uh, at, at this time, uh, the computer business was a lot of fun, and it was, you know, it was burgeoning and um anyone without a degree or even who had ever taken a class you know in uh, in computer programming or in uh, anything like that could get a could get a job and you know make do it for a living that's what i did that was about, about 19 
Yeah, so that that um, I took that job about 1992, something like that. Mm -hmm. So I was uh, so I did that until until 2000, mm -hmm. um, which if uh, if people recall, uh, 2000 was the you know the end of the the end of the boom, right? The dot com bust uh, happened at that time. Mm -hmm. and I I had already decided to get out, so I was I, in that regard my timing was good. Mm -hmm. um, although I enjoyed that, and it was you know it paid well, you know, and uh, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Um, you know, I just didn't feel like it was enough. Uh, I thought that I had I had made a mistake not to finish philosophy, but that was really what I wanted to do. So I quit and went back to graduate school at the same place uh, that I had been before. So then you did do a second PhD. Yes, yeah, so, and so then uh, so then I went back to graduate school. I went, I went back to my old program, mm -hmm. and, uh, finished my dissertation, mm -hmm. wrote, wrote wrote a dissertation there. That you know was a, a matter of uh, a couple of false starts uh, mm -hmm. there. So it it uh, Took a while, but I finally graduated and mm -hmm. got my second PhD in philosophy and um, got this job where I now teach at the City College of San Francisco. Uh, so you you didn't teach when you were at University of Illinois? Oh, yeah. You, uh, you're teaching all the time, te teaching assistants, so sometimes teaching your own courses, sometimes assisting people. Mm -hmm. classes. I also taught um, in a PsyD program in, in Chicago. I taught their cognitive psychology uh, class in a uh, a little a, a professional school for mm -hmm. psychology uh, in Chicago. For, the Adler uh, School. Um, it was called the Illinois School of Professional Psychology. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think they merged subsequently with with another. With Adler. Yeah. So, um, what were the students like at the University of Illinois? This is the um, city. This is the city. Uh, University of Illinois, Chicago. So it's the yeah. city university. That's right. And uh, so there are a lot of commuter students. Uh, there are a lot of, you know, students who are uh, coming to uh, the university for the first time. A lot of, you know, there are a lot of city kids uh, and um, a lot of students. I mean, I, they, they have now uh, built uh, housing on campus. There are dormitories and stuff like that. But uh, that so was really new when I was there. There was uh, very few of them. Most kids, you know, would would drive in or take the train or whatever. So it's a lot of city kids, a lot of kids maybe whose families had gone hadn't gone to college before, yeah. who had gone to Chicago public schools, yeah, and and yeah. many many different ethnic groups, right? Yeah, for sure. It's just loads of it. So what was it like teaching them? And what were you? What was your aim in teaching philosophy? My aim in in teaching philosophy. Uh, was was really to have something to do while I'm doing research at that at that phase of my career I was really interested uh, more in, in 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 the research and learning philosophy and mastering philosophy myself I wasn't I wasn't I wasn't that interested in teaching you know which which I think is kind of a common a common sort of thing people uh, people decide they want to be a philosopher or or, or something like that or a, a scientist or any uh, any uh, anything of that uh, of that kind. But really, what they're dreaming is, is of uh, academic glory, you know. And uh, teaching is kind of a teaching is treated as I have to say, um, at, at the, this is this is true in general. I think at the university, in universities like like UIC, University of Illinois Chicago, or University of Chicago, or any any of these, teaching is is secondary. Uh, they're not, you don't get rewarded, you don't get advancement, you don't get promotion or tenure, you know, for uh, your teaching ability. Nobody asks you how your teaching is in the, in the faculty lounge. Nobody asks you how your teaching is doing. Mm. How, 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 how are your classes going, right? That's not, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, you know, know yeah, it's your research. What are you, what are you writing? What are you working on? And you get no training in teaching either, right? You don't learn like what optimal teaching methods or anything. Uh, that's pretty much right. I, I, I have to, I have to, I'll, I have to say uh, to their credit, the psychology program had a had a teaching class, right? Everybody had to take this uh, this class and in, uh, in how to teach. But uh, in philosophy, no, they mm -hmm. after I had been um, in in philosophy grad school for you know uh, one year, two years, something like that, they gave me my own course to teach mm -hmm. without any, you know, just uh, you just do it. <laughs> mm -hmm. There was no, there was no, um, there was no training or uh, or anything. Um, so the assumption is, if you're an expert in the subject matter, you can teach it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then, then you moved to San Francisco because of your wife's job, right? If I remember yeah. right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And right. you started teaching at the City College of San Francisco. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. And did you take, but you took a different attitude this time or what was your aim here? Well, this time, you know, I was, uh, yeah, this was definitely, you know, a, uh, this is a place where, where teaching, what is, uh, is, is, is what they do. It's not a research institution or anything like that. It's a teaching college, which, you know, there are, there are colleges like small liberal arts colleges or uh, uh, colleges like, like, like city college and so forth, where, you know, re research is really not emphasized. It's uh, although, you know, it's encouraged, you can do it and they, uh, they're, they're proud of you if you do and stuff like that. And so some of these places actually do in a minimal way, uh, have some, uh, have some research requirements for, uh, for instructors, but um, that's not, you know, basically their meat and potatoes is, uh, is teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, I knew that and I thought, you know, well, I would like to do it. And um, so, uh, so it's been, it's, and, and, um, and also, you know, I would say uh, the students at, at, at UIC were not, you know, like the academic elites, right? This isn't Harvard or anything like that. And so uh, bringing them along was kind of part of the, uh, Kind of part of the process and i would say that at, uh, at a place like city college uh that, where, where i am now that's um that's even more true there uh, it's the, the the students run the gamut from the brilliant to uh the totally unmotivated and unbrilliant mm -hmm. and um and so uh, you know so um and and also here's another another factor that has uh and th 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 this, this, I don't know if this is uh, if this is all that useful, um, really, because it's because it j just because it's it's peculiar to uh, to my institution, mm -hmm. uh, which is that we have we have been seeing declining enrollment over the past ten years or so. Uh, mm -hmm. This probably has more to do with demographics and the strength of the economy than uh, than anything. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but 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 anyway, it's been um, uh, it's been a fact, and so um, so there's really been kind of a weird. We're in the position of, of having to vie for students. I mean, you know, it's like uh, we uh, we don't want our classes canceled. We don't want the college to shrink anymore, and, uh, and so on. So, you know, we really need to appeal uh, appeal to students. And and so the pressure the pressure to uh, to do a good job um, and uh, to make it a good experience, good educational experience, and so forth for uh, for students has been has been an intense. Right? You can't take a lordly, you know, I'm the professor, you're the student. Uh, mm -hmm. Type of uh, type of attitude. You really that just won't. I just don't think that will work. And so, and so this has been. Um, so I I, I I have watched my own transformation in short over the decade mm -hmm. or so I've, uh, that I've been doing this. Um, mm -hmm. As uh, I've in many ways gotten better at uh, at uh, at this game. <laughs> I've mm -hmm. gotten better at uh, at teaching, at explaining, at being engaging, at uh, keeping their interest and. Um, mm -hmm. And so on, because it's important, and it's, it's uh, and I, I I regard this as entirely good. You know, um, it's um, it's uh, really really it's the way it should be, uh, but too often it's not. Mm -hmm. This this is a college where you can go for free, or is it small tuition? Or there's a small tuition, um, and now for uh, for San Francisco residents, a few years ago, uh, they 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 introduced a, a program called Free City uh, to mm -hmm. make it free. So it is for for. For city for city residents, which is uh, the bulk of our students, uh, mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's uh, it's literally it's literally free. Mm -hmm. And it's a two year uh, college or two year two year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So people can go there for free, and then they if they do well enough, they can go on to a four year college or university to finish. That's the ambition of uh, of most of them, and it, it, actually, it's a good. So the the whole California. Uh, California has this massive community college system, as it was so-called, of these two-year institutions. And it's, you know, there's, I don't know, I don't know how many students there are overall, but I, I don't know, one or two million or something like that in the system. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's truly massive. And it's, um, it's designed really to be, to be something like that. So, so that rather than, rather than, you know, take your first two couple of years of courses at the, at the expensive four-year uh, institution, you can take it at the inexpensive two-year institution um, and uh, build up your credits and then transfer. I've, tons of my students, that's what that's what they want to do. Yeah, although I know the statistics are very bad on community colleges uh, for people actually completing the program. It's something like 5%. It's, it's really amazing in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And I do wonder whether, uh, I, I know that ever since the 2008 recession, 
there's just been a, a big questioning about even going to college. So I'm not surprised that you've had declining enrollment, even though it's free, you know, mm -hmm. but um, uh, so what's your, so what, why do you want to teach philosophy to these kids? Because I love philosophy. And I want to turn them on to uh, to philosophy. Uh, there, there will always be, um, you know, some students who will who will respond. Um, actually, and and, uh, and that's and that's very gratifying for many of them. For well, for nearly all of them, some some of them arrive knowing that they like philosophy and they're taking philosophy because it's philosophy. You know, they they, they, they want to take philosophy. Uh, but that's uh, that's a very small number. For most of them, it's a general education credit. You know, you so many of these that you have to accumulate. You have some options. I could take philosophy or psychology or economics. Well, philosophy, you know, it fits my schedule. <laughs> you know, as much as as much as anything, I think uh, I think for an awful lot of them. So there's a lot of randomness in in how they come into uh, my class, and for you know, for a lot of them, of course, that's uh, that's all that it uh, it ever is. They they take the course, yeah, this is interesting, and um, and then they move on to the next thing. But um, you know, a certain a definite percentage of them uh, get uh, you know. Get turned on, get uh, get interested, and uh, it wind up majoring in it, and then going off to Berkeley, you know, or something, which has uh, happened repeatedly in my time at uh, uh, at City College. Uh, I and the uh, the other main, so there there are two full time, you know, uh, philosophy professors at uh, it's it's therefore it's a small program, but we've been very successful uh, actually in uh, in getting students. Uh, interested in philosophy to the point of majoring in it and going on to um, four-year schools as philosophy majors and sometimes even to graduate school. So you're very pleased about that. About yeah, that. yeah. So yeah. it's um, shows that you're reaching uh, you're reaching people and getting them interested in philosophy. So what is it about philosophy that's so interesting that you want to get people interested in it? It answer it asks the uh, the deep and important questions of life. You know, uh, instead of um, uh, you know, asking how to make an iPhone or whatever. It asks, what are the uh, what are the values in life that uh, that 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 should be important? You know, are you um, in the activities that you uh, go through in your daily life? Are you doing what you know what will you'll be proud of? Uh, not proud to reflect later in life that uh, that that's what you uh, did, or will you think that uh, that you wasted your time? And what what are the what are the standards of that? Um, is Everything in uh, in the world reducible to physical stuff, to physical matter. You know, I think for most of the 20th century, uh, it was it was certainly it was certainly the, in the ascendancy a kind of naturalism that says, yeah, you know, uh, obviously every there's there's only physical stuff in the world. Everything in the world is material, and uh, you know, we're, we're, life life has been reduced to uh, to molecular biology, and um, you know, so on. All, all the all the things that did. You people used to think were um, required some special. There's no soul and uh, or all of that stuff. Um, that was uh, the way that the, the things were going. Um, but it started to seem, in some ways, like maybe that's maybe that's not inevitable. You know, maybe consciousness, for example, maybe brain functions uh, explain all of psychological functions, but consciousness, maybe not. Reason, reason itself, reason is reason a mechanical, you know, process. Could your computer you know, does, does your computer add two plus two and get four because it sees that two plus two is four, right? In any in in any sense at all, could that could that even be? Yeah. Well, I mean, your 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 computer is electric circuits operating in in uh, in conformity with with physical causation. You know, when you when you see that two plus two equals four, that isn't necessarily a matter of physical causation. It doesn't it doesn't feel that way? And in in any event, if it's reason. Right, then you're then it's the recognition of logical relations. Mm -hmm. It's not it's not physical causation that doesn't that doesn't recognize uh, uh, logical relations. So anyway, so anyway, so that's uh, uh, another big question. What's the basis of uh, of scientific reasoning? Um, you know how how or why is it rational? Um, and um, you know there 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 have been uh, great challenges uh, to that. Um, of course, it's a it's a it's a it's a, it's a long-standing uh, problem. So anyway, um, there are just uh, the 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 profoundest and most interesting questions in life uh, are uh, are philosophical questions, and so I think it's uh, it's right that people should uh, feel a sense of um, 
complexity and wonderment and interest in uh, having an orientation that, that gives them a sense of um, at least that these questions are there and uh, and are important and maybe some uh, some ideas about what uh, what some possible mm -hmm. answers are. It, it really adds to your sense of the meaning of life and mm -hmm. your way of uh, it, the philosophical questions help to, like you said, to to make you understand whether you're using your time per usefully or in a good way or or what so that at the end of your life you well so during your life you uh are actually achieving something that will be satisfying and at the end of your life you'll be happy with what you did mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so tell me how do you do how do you teach the these young students who are coming to you i and tell us tell us about their background for the most part is it similar to the uic students uh yeah um I, I, except that I think uh, UIC students um, are at least paying a large tuition, and you know they they, they have a commitment to uh, to being there. I, I think in a way that uh, students at City College, for the reasons that we've discussed, uh, are uh, perhaps less so. Um, so that overall, it's uh, um, yeah. So uh, overall, maybe they 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 need a little more. They're, they're and 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 often um, their lives are, uh, you know, a little more precarious. I I, I would say uh, there's a lot of homelessness in, in in San Francisco. San Francisco has really become a uh, I hate to say it, but it's really become kind of a, a two layer system. Uh, there's all these rich people in uh, in San Francisco and people who aren't you know necessarily rich exactly, although by by a lot of people's standards, you would say. And I, I'm thinking, I'm thinking of tech employees, uh, computer, uh, uh, software engineers, and um, um, people like that who are making, you know, what. Well, so you, you wouldn't. They're not rich, but they're making princely salaries, and uh, yeah. they're uh, and uh, versus versus people who are living in their cars, you know, or, mm -hmm. uh, and if, if even if it's not that bad, it's not it's not necessarily very good. It's mm -hmm. it's really getting kind of to be like that, mm -hmm. and I so. I have students in my classes who are living in their cars. Um, mm. I, have, I, I have had homeless people. I had a guy. <laughs> I had a guy a couple couple years ago in my in my classroom. Uh, the kind the kind of derelict, un, uh, unshaven, who wears wears three coats and uh, carries uh, trash bags, you know, full of their 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 stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, this that was this guy. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> it was uh, it was sort of it was it was sort of amazing. I don't know how I don't know how um, how he managed, but he got an A. <laughs> huh. He was uh, he was uh, he was an older guy, and uh, you know, I guess he knew uh, he knew what he wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I, I was sorry, I never really got to talk to him or find out his story uh, mm -hmm. a little better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 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 anyway, there's a, there's a lot of vulnerability. Uh, mm -hmm. So, more how, so do you, how do you teach them philosophy? What kinds of things do you do? Um. Well, I guess I guess. Uh, I um, I try to I try to uh, present things um, in in a way that I uh, I'm not sure I'm not sure how to uh, how to say this. Um, it's important, I think. I I, I I've come to to see to be uh, to be clear. And emphatic, and uh, um, you know, pr provide a, a sense of definiteness, at least about what the questions are, about what the distinctions are that are important, and uh, and so forth. So I, I'm trying, I'm trying to avoid saying simplifying because I don't, I don't feel like I uh, like I simplify. And um, my students, you know, are often telling me, you know, that this is uh, this is abstract, this is complex. I, I don't know what the hell is going on, and uh, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so that so that I, they 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 don't experience it as uh, as uh, as simple or easy or uh, or anything like that. But it's important. That we, here's here's an example. Uh, I was what just going to say, why don't you give us some examples? Um, yeah. Uh, what is what is uh, truth? Right? Truth is a big philosophical issue. You know, as you uh, as you might as you might suppose. Uh, tons of uh, there's a, a a giant literature on the, 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 this question of what is. It's true then you could make and and it's not it's a actually it's a it's a, it's a great example of a philosophical question because um 
people use this word. It's one of the, it's a word that people use all the time, but don't reflect on you know what exactly it means. And if you ask people like what is what so what does something have to be to be true? Mm -hmm. You say you know because all this randomness. I mean, it's people just and um, so uh, in the in the class on uh, so-called metaphysics and epistemology. So this is like the basic questions about. Uh, yeah, well, so what are what is metaphysics what is, and what is metaphysics and what is epistemology? Uh, metaphysics just stands for it's the, 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 the philosophers label for uh, the, 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 the basic facts structure of the, of the world. What is it made of? Uh, what you know is uh, how many are there are, how many different kinds of fundamental things or elements or stuff uh, mm -hmm. you know, for, So for example, mind and matter are both required uh, or you know is everything in the end matter or is everything in the end mind does god exist these are all metaphysical questions okay um, epistemology on the other side is theory of knowledge how do we know things is every all knowledge come through the senses or is there a, we have some other means of knowledge that's not uh, that's not based on the senses uh logic and what's its uh, what is its role and um so 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 stuff so so these are these are all like the the, the base issues of uh, of philosophy, and um, you know clearly, then uh, terms like knowledge, truth, fact, uh, things like this are going to be the, the, the kinds of words that we're going to be using all the time. And um, uh, in a in a class like this, if um, uh, well, if 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 one of the subject matters, like if we did a, we did a sequence, a module, or whatever, we we did a week or two on the question of truth and. We could talk about theories of truth and uh, stuff like that, but uh, but we don't. And so I just tell them, I just give them a definition. So uh, you know, truth is, you know, when uh, tr truth truth is a property of statements in the first place. We're not talking about a true friend, right, or a you know a true Scotsman or anything like that. We're talking about the, you know, statements. This is what is true, and what it is for a statement to be true is for what it says uh, is the case to be the case. Right? Statements have meanings. If the meaning of the statement is something something it describes it says says something about the way things are uh, the statement is true when things are the way it says the way the statement says and uh, so just and 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 there are some important implications uh, some things follow from this one thing that follows that might seem a little surprising at first uh, is that truth is metaphysical you might think that truth is on the knowledge side right because when we when we seek for knowledge we're seeking the truth and so knowledge, truth, right? They seem, they, seem, they seem to go together. But that's not actually right. Uh, truth is a metaphysical matter. Truth is a matter of the way things are, regardless of whether you know it. Um, you know, if I tell you that there's a pot of gold buried uh, two meters below the North Pole of Mars, um, is that true or not? Well, we don't know because we haven't been. We can just pro probably not, probably not. But, uh, but we you know, we haven't we haven't determined this for sure because uh, we haven't been there. But you know, the, the here's the here's the thing: it is already true, or it is already false, one or the other, right now. Right? We don't have to go there uh, and, uh, and 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 dig a hole for 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 it to become true or for it to become false. It already is, mm -hmm. uh, and that's um, uh, you know, so so so. So that truth, like the world, reality, is the goal of knowledge, right? But it's not knowledge, right? The truth is something that's already there and that we are seeking to find when we uh, when we seek knowledge. So 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 this is a kind of a kind of a basic lesson, like a day one in a metaphysics and epistemology class. And um, notice that I'm just kind of being dogmatic here. You know, I'm not I'm not opening this up as a question: what is truth or anything anything like that? Because that would just be chaos. Uh, so I, I I think that um, I think that to in 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 certain ways to just say you know here are the issues. Uh, this is what it is, and um, you know uh, on the basis of this we'll we'll go on to ask further questions. But uh, you know for now we'll just take this as you know this is our definition. And actually and then and then through the through the through the whole rest of the semester well, we'll uh, keep hammering with this. So it's, Questions about truth will come up on quizzes or other uh, assignments uh, throughout the until until they get it. And I I, I hope that uh, one thing that they leave the class with uh, by the end by the end of that course, if nothing else, is that uh, tr truth is when uh, what they the is truth is when uh, 
what a statement says is the case is the case. That's uh, that's truth, and you know you can just sort of um, just just go with that. So so that's trying to be clear and uh, that it's it, it isn't simple, right? It took me five ten minutes or what, what, what whatever I, that I uh, that I'm talking about this, yeah. but it's but I I I hope that it's clear and memorable. Mm -hmm. And I would think especially uh, with all of the questioning of authority and what was what people what the government would made us do and whether the vaccines are good or not and all that that probably would seem very relevant the last couple of years yeah actually actually uh kind of an icebreaker sort of initial first day discussion in that in in, in that particular class is a uh, uh, an essay by scott alexander he's a blogger who's you know become a big kind of a big star in some some regions um on um what, what, what he calls epistemic learned helplessness, uh, which mm. is uh, which is um, the the question of uh, to what to what extent should when should you rely on uh, on authority and when should you use your own judgment mm. and um, uh, so and that's right that that's a very pertinent uh, issue just as you say that's a very pertinent issue for today where you know we've got all these people saying that you can't trust the government about vaccines elections masks mm. you know and on and on and um uh, and and you know can forget forget the government can you try, trust anthony fauci you know and uh all that so that's um should like you believe your doctor or should you believe somebody else or should you how, how should you decide what to what to do yeah and when do you when do you try to take matters into i mean so yeah leaving aside the politics stuff uh, doctors I, I i had actually a student so an awful lot of my students are also you know they have jobs they're you know juggling a, a whole bunch of things and this one who's a medical professional was saying uh, i hate it when you know patients come in and they've been on webmd you know finding out about their you know, the, <laughs> and I, I think that this is a very common you know uh, phenomenon now so, so with the internet people can investigate their diseases and uh they become they've they've read some Wikipedia stuff and uh, WebMD and some stuff like that and uh, they go in and they start, you know, telling their doctor what they want or arguing mm. with, the, with the doctor and uh, and stuff like that and that's that's a great uh, that's a great example you know so the doctor has been to medical school and you know uh, studied this friend has been practicing for a long mm. time and so forth and in a sense you know in in, in that sense has qualifications but are you just supposed to roll over and say you know oh well whatever the doctor says. Mm -hmm maybe not right that's not necessarily rational or uh, appropriate either but then how do you decide that's the right and then and then you have the problem where most people really have very little context for understanding their medical things mm -hmm. or their medical condition and so their understanding of what they read is not full enough to uh mm -hmm. to really make a good judgment and that's where the doctor comes in and the doctors aren't particularly well trained at dealing with that you know dealing with to, yeah. explaining to the the reason i know this is because i ask my doctors a lot of questions mm -hmm. and it's interesting to see i fire the ones that don't answer the questions uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's interesting to see how well they can explain why they're doing this or that or why they made this judgment to have you do this versus that you know mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. What uh, so so? How do your students receive this? What happens in your classrooms? I think uh, the, the the pattern that I tend to see is uh, a lot of perplexity and struggle in the beginning, that uh, smooths out over the course of the semester. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I just wrapped up a course. Uh, yes, it was. We're, it's maybe kind of late uh, in the. It might seem like it's kind of late in the year, but we're uh, we're in finals week uh, right now, so the semester for me is not actually uh, over yet. And um, I so I had this uh, I had this class uh, this uh, this semester where um, really really in the first the first few meetings uh, it seemed like all hell was breaking loose. This was a this was a class that only meets once a week, mm. so three hours once uh, once a week, and. Um, the first couple of meetings were uh, were pretty rocky, you know, I, because I think that the students, a lot of them, well, because they care, you know, uh, they're, uh, they're 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 kind of freaking out. The reading is hard, and uh, uh, the questions on quizzes and stuff like that are uh, they're struggling with them. And um, 
you know, they're just afraid that uh, they're going to fail and, uh, and all this. So, um, so there was a lot of, you know, calming them down and, you know, uh, trying to explain things like this, uh, this, uh, this question of uh, truth and um, <clears throat> a bunch of other, bunch of other stuff like that. And, um, you know, at, at, so at, at, at the beginning, <clears throat> there are a lot of very familiar, uh, I'm sorry, un, unfamiliar abstract concepts and issues and questions that they're, mm -hmm. uh, they're dealing with. You know, um, I think here, here, here would be uh, maybe another example. Uh, I think that a lot of um, uh, people, people find it intuitive. So, so, so think about sen sense perception, vision, um, how vision works, there's light rays, there's the lens of your eye and it focuses the image on the retina and all, all that stuff is the mechanics of vision are pretty pretty straightforward. This is the, the, the science side. The philosophy side is what kind of relation to reality does that set up? Right. So so take all all, all the physics, all the, the all the mechanical stuff for granted. Mm -hmm. What do you get out of it? Right? What's the what is that experience? Is that a direct contact with the world? Is that a you know, it, it, when all is said and done is what is what you get a, a little image in your in your, on a screen as it were a virtual screen in your uh, in your mind that uh, that uh, that you see or or or, or something else um, that th this kind of question <clears throat> doesn't really even strike most people as a question but they mm -hmm. haven't thought about this before mm -hmm. I mean they, they might think it's interesting it's cool the light rays and the and the lens of the eye and the focusing and, uh, and all that stuff but the the more abstract well, what do you get out of it anyway? I mean, what 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 sort of relation to the world mm -hmm. does that establish? Mm -hmm. uh, is not is not a familiar. Is, uh, people aren't aren't even used to thinking that way. So 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 in, in short, uh, I think that they feel at sea uh, at the uh, at the beginning. But over mm -hmm. time, uh, it uh, it starts to come easier. They 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 get they get used to thinking uh, uh, in in terms of these kinds of questions. And um, some of them, they get, they get used to it. They, they, they might not ever like it, um, but others uh, find it fascinating mm -hmm. you know, that there are these, uh, these deep and important questions that are not obvious, but actually uh, are important. And so, um, so, so, so over the course of the semester, you know, I think uh, they, they come along, they get, uh, they get used to it. They, mm -hmm. yeah. And and they, you know it it it, it, start, it starts to come easier they, they they become successful right I I watch them become successful. What do you do to help them do that become successful? Um, mainly mainly I just keep doing what I'm doing and I encourage them to stick with it and not freak out. <laughs> That's basically. Uh, I mean I just uh, so I. I you mean bringing up the examples and the issues and. What do you what what do you mean by doing what you're doing? Oh, I mean uh, the 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 kind of approach to teaching that I was illustrating with by by, by talking about truth uh, a little while ago. Um, <clears throat> you know, I uh, I keep try, trying to present things in a uh, although although it's so the, the thing is although it's, although it's abstract and uh, and unfamiliar um, if you're definite. You know, I mean, so so in in, in other words, a, some 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 philosophers, some approaches to philosophy are, uh, I, I think, trying trying to be undogmatic. Uh, you know, try, are by trying to be undogmatic, what they actually do is uh, they come across as, as very wishy washy. Well, you know, the answer could be this or it could be that. You know, so this is a you know this is a deep philosophical question. Who knows what the what the answers are. You know, I don't think that students respond to that very well. Mm -hmm. I think students want to feel like, even if there's not, we're not saying, you know, here's here's the answer. That would that would be sort of uh, sort of dogmatic. But at, at at any rate, here are here are what the issues are, and mm -hmm. in a in a in a in a clear way that's 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 definite. That's uh, that's determinate. Mm -hmm. So that uh, so that you know, so that so that. So if there are there are it's not that there aren't open questions, <clears throat> uh, but there it's it's clear what the questions are, right? I so I I, um, I try to I try to I try to emphasize that I try to keep things, which is which is you know you know it's a, can be a little difficult with philosophy. Mm -hmm. Philosophy is um, slippery, uh, mm -hmm. and um, so I try to make it unslippery by uh, in the in the way I'm, I guess I'm repeating myself at this point, but. Um, 
Uh, <clears throat> I try to make it unslippery by having the, the, the issues at least, what are the problems, what are the distinctions, mm -hmm. what are the questions, be uh, quite clear and determinate and mm -hmm. no, you know, no fuzzy. <laughs> so I, I, I kind of black and white about, mm -hmm. uh, about what the issues are and, uh, and what the questions are. So, so I emphasize that and, um, and I, 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 just, I just keep doing that and um, eventually they come along. So they ha they have a pretty clear set of ideas and principles to to it. They're trying to master a new subject, and that's always hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. But you're giving them a clear set of ideas and principles to use in thinking about this subject, and then eventually they start get getting it. They start understanding and start applying it. And you know, if they're interested, they could always get into involved in the quandaries later. At least oh, this yeah. way, you're giving them some solid ground to start with. Um, what was I going to ask you? Uh, so I think, I, I think the clarity. I think clarity about the issues is the is the mm -hmm. is the is a, is a good entry point. Yeah, mm -hmm. like you like you say, um, the it 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 can become um, to, to to actually answer the actually answer the questions. Uh, that's 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 another thing that's uh, mm -hmm. that's difficult. Uh, but if if it isn't even clear what the questions are, then that just becomes a mess. Mm -hmm. And uh, so 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 the 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 entry the entry point is to have uh, issues. And I mean, you know, um, I think I think actually, Ayn Rand, right? To just to, to bring up a name, uh, is some um, is good in that way. Uh, she makes the issues clear. Mm -hmm. and, um, that's uh, one reason that she has an intuitive appeal mm -hmm. uh, to people who are coming to philosophy for the first time. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a good thing uh, mm -hmm. to, uh, to make the issues clear. For example, in her essay, Philosophy Who Needs It, mm -hmm. it's very, yeah. it makes the issues very clear. Mm -hmm. so, um, in, so in the end, you, you think maybe you set you send these students off with at least some idea about the issues of philosophy. Some of them begin very engaged in it. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. You've been teaching remotely for the last couple of years, haven't you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How's that compared to when you were teaching in person? It sucks totally. <laughs> it's, uh, it's terrible. What? I mean, yeah. Well, uh, what's, tell me the dimensions that are you, you don't like the dimensions of suckatude, the, uh, yes. the the depth of the, uh, of the terribleness of this. Right. Um, it's uh, well, it's bad. It's bad um, on 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 many levels. Uh, it's um, and I guess I guess uh, I don't where 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 to begin. Um, when this started. Uh, it was uh, kind of an emergency, you know, and everybody, you know, just kind of uh, uh, got down, and, you know, rolled up their sleeves and did a, a, a massive amount of work. I certainly did, and I think everyone in my position did, uh, to convert their their classes to an online format and to just kind of get through it. And um, and uh, you know, it was in a way, in a way, at that time in the in the beginning, it was um, it was actually sort of exciting. And I did, didn't really care about the uh, how quality uh, decreased because I figured, well, it's it's, it's necessary. This is an emergency, and it's uh, it's temporary. Um, as time has dragged on, though, uh, the, the excitement and the the urgency has uh, has has disappeared, and and there's only there's only the deficits that are uh, that are Which, left. And what are and they? The, so so um, when. Uh, I, I, uh, I suppose I suppose the main thing uh, is that there is a um, uh, a lack of personal touch, I guess, in uh, in being in being remote. There isn't the same sense of uh, uh, one. Well, I was was about to say one on one. There, there isn't the same sense of um, uh, Inter interacting with uh, with other humans in a room that uh, that you have in an in person class, um, everybody is uh, you know in their own in their own house. Usually, people don't turn their video on uh, for uh, for meetings. 
Um, this is highly, sorry. They don't turn their video on? No. Oh my almost gosh. no, almost, almost no students do. Oh yeah, I, I so uh, um, so the, the the way it's become now is that uh, there's a canned lecture, there's a recorded lecture. I don't actually record myself uh, lecturing or anything like that, but I uh, I always I always uh, use PowerPoint slides when I'm when I'm lecturing in the, in the classroom. So I so I had these slides, and what I did was I just recorded audio comments. On uh, so mm -hmm. so in a, in a, in effect a sort of a video, but it's just the slides with me mm -hmm. talking, mm -hmm. and that, so that's like an hour and a half lecture or something like that for uh, for uh, for each week, and so 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 they have to review that and do the reading, and uh, we have we have meetings by Zoom, and then there's uh, quizzes or discussion posts or something like that, some uh, some kind of an assignment, mm -hmm. and um, so uh, <clears throat> so the the. The canned lecture, right? The 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 recordings by by audio comments on uh, on the slides are, you know, inferior. It would be better if I could if I could address people in person live, where I could see their reactions. I know whether they're getting it or not, or whether something needs to be explained more, or whether you know I'm over explaining because uh, you know the people are trying to get bored. You no, know, you can when you're in the room with people, yeah, you can see that uh, with the canned lecture. Of course, I just have to, you know, I. I it's uh, it's the way it is, and uh, they uh, they either get it or not. I don't think that it's a particularly good listening to a canned lecture like that. Is I don't know think, think that that's a, a particularly uh, good. But then we have we have the live Zoom meeting, mm -hmm. and um, so so you know what I, what what I see is there's me and may, you know two or three at most uh, other people who turn their their cameras on, and for the rest it's a bunch of black squares. Mm -hmm. And um, this is highly annoying to, uh, to th 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 this is everyone's experience, all, all classes, un un unless the teacher requires people mm -hmm. to turn on their, uh, their video, this is the way it, it always is. And, um, uh, and um, all teachers hate this. And mm -hmm. to try, I, I, I try to encourage students to, uh, to turn on their cameras and have more of an interaction, uh, but uh, they're reluctant to do it. And I, I, I I, find, I finally have decided, I finally, I finally figured out, I guess, uh, that the main reason that they do this, people talk about, well, people are embarrassed about where they live or, you know, they're in their car or, you know, and stuff like that. And that's, you I'm sure. put one of those right. screens on. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, you can, you can yeah. have a fake background and all mm -hmm. that. That's not, that's not really what's going on. I think what's going on is that they're on stage, you know. Uh, you know, if, 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 you have, if you have your camera on, then people are looking at you. You know, while the while the discussion is going on, people are looking at the screen. They can see everybody. They can see mm -hmm. what the people are doing and what they look like, and you know, and uh, stuff like that. And I think that just people just you know, I, I don't want I don't want people staring at me. You know, in a, in a classroom, everyone is looking at the at the uh -huh. front of the room, right? In uh, in Zoom, everyone is looking at each other, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that people don't like that. I don't mm -hmm. think that's fundamentally uh, the reason why that is. But but for whatever the reason, it sucks because. It's not. It's even less of a. It's even less of a genuine human interaction when you're talking to a yeah. to a voice when you're talking to a black square, and um, so uh, and yeah. So that's um, and 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 furthermore, um, I think uh, the the lack of a live you know in 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 person engagement uh, with people yeah. is. Uh, is is demotivating. I don't want to say it's unmo. I think it's 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 demotivating mm -hmm. when, when you have to show up uh, in, in a physical classroom and interact with other people. Uh, that is you know, for 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 one thing. It's a kind of commitment you have to travel there. You know this is this 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 gets people engaged, caring, and uh, and mm -hmm. so forth. Just because of the uh, the effort that it takes uh, to do that. But then also you have person to person, you know, interactions with your fellow students, with the teacher, you have relationships and so forth. Mm -hmm. This adds meaning to the whole experience and it's yeah. motivating also. And um, all that, all that has disappeared with now everyone's just sitting at home. Uh, they go to their job or they manage their kids or, or whatever. And they, they, they try to do these classes on the side. And um, I think that they get seduced actually into thinking, well, you know, I can just do this. It'll be, mm -hmm. you know, I can, I can I can still manage my job and my kids and stuff like that, and I do this class on the side. Yeah. And uh, you know, it turns out it's hard. It's more time consuming than than they think, and uh, and mm -hmm. they drop out. So there's that. There's this sort of this is a, the seductive. I don't have to. I don't have to actually go there. It'll be easy. I can mm -hmm. uh, I can manage this when 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 they can't. That's one thing. The other thing though is what I'm this demotivational uh, factor that I'm uh, that I'm talking about. They're just not. 
it's just it's just it's just less real yeah uh, and 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 without the personal without the personal element um there's less incentive right there's just less um uh people often do things for the sake of their relationships with others you know even mm -hmm. if it's just your classmates or uh the teacher and uh, stuff like that these are these are important uh elements in in, in keeping people going yeah. um and uh there's they're, they're they're completely deprived of uh, of that by uh, by this remote uh, learning uh, experience. Some people, of course, are self starters. You know, they're good at school. They can they can read books and learn on their own and stuff like that, and they uh, they can thrive here. But that's not most people. Mm -hmm. Most people are really struggling. Um, it's well, been terrible. It's like Aristotle said: humans are the most social of animals, mm -hmm. and you're exactly. taking that away. Yeah, taking yeah. that almost completely yeah. away. Well, that's a very sad situation. I'm sorry that you've had to try to teach in, in that situation. I'm sorry for those students too that they they get seduced into thinking this is an advantage when it's actually yeah. a big disadvantage. You know. Yeah. So, um, well, I don't want to keep you too much longer since I think we've been talking like an hour. Um, yeah. Is there any last thing you might want to say about teaching philosophy or? Obviously, you you still feel motivated to do it since you've been doing it through all this. Oh yeah, I um, I like it better the more I do it. Um, I uh, I feel like um, you know when I when I when I started doing this, we we were talking about how there's 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 no there's no real training you know about how to teach or anything mm -hmm. like that in the in the university setting, and um, uh, so so really you know I just did I just imitated. My own professors. I just, you know, I just, I just ran my classes the way my own classes had been when I was in classes, and uh, and so, you know, I was uh, pretty wooden, and I would say uh, in the beginning, and um, you know, just trying, trying, trying to stay on a script and uh, and things like that. Uh, I uh, well, actually, here, here, the, the, there's a second point. So um, to finish the first, um, uh, I've I've become much more uh, spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Relax, you know, and um, available. I think, in a way, in a way, to my students than uh, than I was in the, in the beginning, mm -hmm. which is just a matter of you know learning to uh, learning to relate uh, uh, mm -hmm. people and uh, and to be and to be a better communicator. Um, in, in in that way, personally, um, it's been very good for me. I'm I'm, I'm profoundly I'm profoundly introverted. <laughs> I would I would like nothing more than to just sit in this room with these books and just uh, <laughs> read them all day and, yeah. uh, and and do my own writing and stuff like that. So um, uh, interacting with, um, uh, with 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 people, bringing them along, encouraging them, and so uh, working with them and, uh, mm -hmm. and so on and so forth has been. Um, no, I, I think you know, it's. it's uh, um, I wouldn't say that it's opened me up very well, but I would say that it's um, it's it's. It's forced me to uh, to learn the skills of, uh, of um, you know being a being a good communicator, being encouraging, you know, at least putting on putting on the appearance of uh, <laughs> you know openness and outgoingness and uh, and so on. So that's um, uh, that's uh, that's one thing. And another, I'll say just uh, the, 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 these both come under the heading, I guess, of personal benefits of uh, of teaching philosophy. Uh, it has forced me to learn it so much better myself. Mm -hmm. you know, I have a much better grasp of. Uh, I've I've started uh, teaching a lot of a lot of the history of philosophy and a lot of various uh, issues in philosophy that I wasn't particularly an expert in, mm -hmm. and um, I uh, I have a very I have a very you know after you've explained these things enough times and had enough you know different students ask you different questions from different perspectives that are coming at you from all mm -hmm. sides and, and mm -hmm. so on. Um, it really, it really, uh, uh, it confers a kind of mastery of the subject mm -hmm. uh, that uh, that you wouldn't get otherwise, and so, mm -hmm. so that's also been really nice. Well, that's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to tell us about your experience at the City College and your background and everything yes. like that. No I really appreciate it. And I just want to remind the audience to ring to hit the bell and subscribe. And to please look us up at thegreatconnections.org. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you, Marshall.